Okay, everyone. Uh, it's a, a real pleasure um, to do this. I, I'm really sorry um, I can't be there with you in person. I, I tried really hard and it, it, it just didn't work. So um, thanks very much to the organizers for agreeing to let me do this um, remotely. So today I'm going to be talking about the galactic environment and its connection to the interstellar medium and star formation. Um, and what I really hope in this introduction to the lecture is to show you why this matters for understanding um, how stars form in galaxies and why it's important. Okay, so a quick a quick outline of the talk. Um, basically, I'm going to start off by having an illustrative example which is going to show you a lot of the processes which are important in the cold interstellar medium and why they are connected um, to the structure of the galaxy. And then I'm going to look at a kind of brief census of the different types of environment um, that we find in our Milky Way, um, at which point we'll have a short break um, for questions. And then we'll have another section which looks at you know, how gas is accumulated in cold, dense gas in galaxies um, to form molecular clouds. Um, and then we'll have another um, short break. And then we're going to end up looking at how the different scales are connected um, through filamentary structure. Okay, so, so that's the plan for the next, next two hours. Um, please do interrupt me if you have comments or questions, that's, that's absolutely fine. Um, okay, so this is our example. Now, I think anyone who is interested in looking at galaxies and how cold gas um, and the interstellar medium forms will just be really blown away by the recent results from JWST um, and FANGS. So this is here is a beautiful image made by the FANGS collaboration. It's NGC 265. And I have to say, personally, I'm a theorist. So the fact that I can just rhyme that galaxy name off without even thinking about it um, tells you how important it is as a, as a wonderful illustrative example. So what you can see here in, is the dust emission. You can see where the dust is tracing the gas in the galaxy. And we can use this to illustrate the different processes involved in star formation and where they're important. So up here we have, um, can you see my pointer moving? Yep. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Um, so there's these little red dots here. That shows you where we have very reddened gas. It's where we have sites of star formation. And right away we can see the connection with the galactic structure because where are we finding these sites of star formation? We're finding them in the spiral arms. And you can see they just kind of line up along the spiral arm. And so immediately we have one of the themes of, of this lecture, and that is that the gas is assembled into these structures by the large scale galactic dynamics. So there we are, our beautiful spiral arms, nice and clear. But that's not the other thing you can probably see in this image. If you look, you can see these really large bubbles. Like this one down here has been named the Phantom Void, which is a fantastic name. Who's been looking at that? And you can see that they, there are these huge structures in the interstellar medium. And these are being blown out by regions of star formation, where we have supernovae explosions, which are injecting energy and injecting momentum into their surroundings. And this is shaping the structure of the galaxy. And right away, what that shows us is that there is this coupling between the two systems. The large scale, the galaxy, that shows you where you can bring gas together. It sets the initial conditions for star formation. But then at the other end of the process, once you have those stars, the mass of stars will go supernova. And even before that, they all blow huge um, photoionization 
regions in from the hot OB stars, injecting more momentum, more energy, ionizing their surroundings, changing the energy balance in the interstellar medium around them. And what this do does is it in turn shapes the form of the galaxy and alters how subsequent stars will form. And in doing so, it also alters the future evolution of the galaxy disk. I mean, after all, if we didn't have stars forming in the interstellar medium, gravity would just pull everything together like a pancake. And uh, we wouldn't be going on for very long. <laughs> but because we have this interlocking between the scales where the energy formed by star formation feeds back to large scale, that alters the subsequent evolution of the galaxy. And we call this the baryonic matter cycle, this interplay between gas going through the phases of the interstellar medium from hot dense gas down to cold star forming gas, which then injects energy into the surroundings, it throws gas out of the galaxy, which can rain back down and form subsequent genres of galaxies. And so we see that this is intrinsically an interlinked process. Okay. So another thing which shows you how the galaxy will alter the subsequent star formation, the conversion of, of gas to stars, is the fact that it is rotating. And we have differential rotation in this system. And what that means is that if you have a parcel of gas, which is on a different orbit, over time, they will get torn apart. And so this differential rotation will stretch the material out um, in these spiral arms. And that itself can alter the geometry of the structures, um, but also tear things apart, can be a destructive force um, in this case. And all of this galaxy is bathed in an interstellar radiation field, mainly from the results of the photoionizing, the, the hot UV photons um, from young stars, but also from cosmic rays. And again, galactic environment is important here. This radiation field is heating the gas. And of course, it's hot gas is more stable and is less likely to fragment or collapse under gravity. But this radiation field is varying throughout the galaxy. So the galactic center, for example, and we'll discuss that later, you would have an interstellar radiation field, which is 100 times as high. So here again, we have this intersection with where you are in the galaxy. You'll get different properties for how your gas could collapse to form stars. Another thing which varies throughout the galaxy is the metallicity gradient. So when the stars from previous generation explode, of course, what they also do is they enrich their surroundings. You know, at the center of the stars, we have heavy elements which are formed. And then in the supernova, and as a result of the supernova explosion itself, we build up the metals, which will enrich the surrounding gas. And as we will discuss later, this will determine how the gas can cool and future star formation. And so again, where you are in the galaxy matters. And all of this, just in case this was not simple enough, is threaded by a diverse magnetic field throughout our galactic region, which again seems to align with galactic strail structures. And so what I hope I've given you with this just simple example is not using any words, not using any equations, just using a simple picture. You can see the complexity of structure in the interstellar medium and how this can alter star formation and the interstellar medium in general in these different environments. And so this is the aim 
of this lecture to investigate how these different envir environments affect the ISM and star formation. Now, there are things I'm not going to do. Um, so you have many lectures this week. So if you want to look more about feedback and from stars, um, there's going to be a lecture um, by Melanie Chavant. Um, that's a very important process, which I wouldn't have time to do justice to in a single lecture. There's more on the star formation itself, the details of star formation, in a talk on simulations of star formation by Steffi Walsh. And I believe you're also going to have a lecture which will give you more detail about turbulence, which is also a very important process in the interstellar medium. So I'm going to focus more on the galactic connection here. And so what we've seen here is the galactic conditions set the internal temperature, they set the metallicity and the ability of the gas to cool, and its internal turbulence. Whereas the feedback will oppose further star formation, it'll provide pressure support to the galaxy disk, add metals, and drive the Sparian cycle. Okay, so that's, that's the introduction um, sorted. Now let's look at the specific different environments within the Milky Way galaxy. So here we have a beautiful artist impression of our Milky Way. Um, of course, we don't actually see this. All of this is derived um, from the inside and it's, it's very difficult to do, actually, because, of course, when you're within the plane of the galaxy, it is really hard to dis and disentangle these different arm features. And a lot of work has gone into that. Um, but what we are fairly certain of now is that we are in a barred spiral galaxy. That there are multiple spiral arms extending out from these. And that these are not necessarily all well ordered. So I'm going to mainly use um, the Milky Way um, as our example. We maybe find it hard to disentangle all the bits. Um, but it is where we can understand the processes in the most detail. But we will illustrate this with um, examples from other extragalactic sources which are nearby and where we can see the structure of the galaxy more clearly and put these things into context. Okay, so the sun is out here um, in the middle and we can see the different components of, of the galaxy here and um, which we're going to examine. So we've got the bulge, we have a disk, and we also have outside a kind of stellar and globular halo, and where stars, which I'm mainly going to ignore for this because I'm going to focus more um, on where the gas is. Okay, but before we get into the details, we should um, just have a little bit um, really zooming out to understand that our galaxy is not in isolation actually. And that it is part of this larger cosmological web. So here is a, a nice image um, from the Virgo Consortium. It's showing you the cold, dark matter structure. And as you can see, and as you probably know from undergraduate lectures, you get this web of structure where you have filaments of gas due to gravitational collapse, um, which form... And then we get hub systems where these filaments merge um, and link. And at the center of these um, get dark matter halos. And this is what our Milky Way is sitting at the center of. So we have our nice dark matter halo here. And the reason that I mention that is because that, of course, sets the gravitational potential in which our galaxy lives and is important for confining the gas within our galaxy. And so it's something we cannot entirely ignore. So here we have the different models of the dark matter halo. Um, again, probably from Cosmology 101, you are well aware of the NFW um, profile. So basically we have some sort of um, spherically symmetric um, profile, which has some sort of flattening at the center. Um, and so we have declining dark matter and um, density in the outer regions and a core and possibly a cusp 
at the centre. And this is the environment which our gas um, will feel the potential from this. And one thing I should say is that just as a qualification, this is all very beautiful and semi comes from very nice um, simulations and it's all very perfect. Um, but actually with Gaia, um, people are beginning to trace some of the motions and use that as a tracer for the dark matter potential. And one of the things we're seeing is that actually real dark matter halos probably have a lot more substructure. And this might not be as universal as people think that galaxy history, how a galaxy was formed, um, does have an influence um, on the actual structure of the dark matter. But for us, for our purposes, all that is important is that this gives us a potential in which our gas can live. Okay, so let's start to look at the phases. So we have, um, at the beginning, we have the bulge. Um, so here we have a kind of old stars at the centre of the galaxy, quasi-spherical distribution. And we can get different flavours of bulge. Um, so in the classical bulge, there's no star formation. We only have old population three stars and we have basically random orbits. So we just motions moving like this and you get this quasi-spherical option, which is almost decoupled from the evolution of the disk. However, interestingly, we have also found that you can get um, pseudo bulges these days. Um, so you can have ordered rotation. These are actually probably more common than people thought. Um, they're correlated with spiral arm structure. And intriguingly, actually, you can see some ongoing star formation in these objects um, in rare cases. Okay. But, but now let's focus on more what's important um, for the interstellar medium. So in terms of the disk, for the stellar disk, we have the thick disk. This contains about 10% um, of the stellar mass, and it has quite a large extended um, scale height, about a kiloparsec for our Milky Way. And we find that this is quite old in the Milky Way, 10 gig years or more, and metal poor. And it's quite kinematically and chemically distinct from the thin disk, which is the one that's more associated with star formation and the interstellar medium in the present day. So this contains about 85% of the stars. It's got a scale height between three and 400 parsec, and it's got multiple age populations. Basically, what you have is that this is where we're having the multiple generations of star formation um, within the disk. And as I said, this is populated by a gas disk. Um, so we can model this uh, as two disks. So we have the thicker H1 disk. Um, so this is atomic hydrogen. And this has a scale height of about 100 parsecs. So we can see already much narrower than the, the stellar distribution. <laughs> but we also have a thinner H2 disk with a scale height of about only um, 50 parsecs. And so just from all this work we've done in the gravitational potential, you can see this has already put some limits on how the gas in the galaxy can evolve. So there's obviously a maximum size due to the vertical extent of the clouds. Um, you can't really, it's hard to form lots of molecular gas when you're outside um, the plane of the disk with the gravity pulling you down. Um, but also it influences, you know, this maximum scale which structures can fragment on. Because on a large scale, we're no longer just thinking about fragmentation in a 3D medium. Because we have the confines of the disk and that disk is rotating, the criteria for stability will be that of the tumory instability. Again, probably seen this before, but it is worthwhile to revisit this in a galactic context. So the basic idea between the, for the tumory criteria is that you have a disk, and if you have a, a perturbation in the disk, whether it is growing, 
it has to be able to grow, to collapse, to become more over dense faster than shearing motions in a differentially rotating disc will tell it apart. And so we're looking at that balance between if we have a little over density, can it collapse down faster than that rotation is going to pull it apart? And so we can express this um, in the form of a, a perturbation of the, the frequency. And this is in terms of the epicyclic frequency, which is basically the frequency at which a, a radially displaced fluid parcel will oscillate. So if you have a little fluid parcel and you move it up, as it goes round, it will go up and down and up and down um, in your disc. And we had call that the epicyclic frequency. So if we assume for a perturbation that we have some sort of wave formula, if we express it in this way, we can see that where the angular frequency squared is smaller than M0, the real solution, if we don't have a real solution, then that perturbation will grow. And so when you work through the maths, we get this Tumri um, criteria, which implies for stability, we need to consider the um, epicyclic frequency, the sound speed, um, within the disk medium, the local gravity, and of course, the surface density. And so when you put those numbers in to a Milky Way disk, what you find is that in the solar neighborhood, you arrive at a Q value of about one. And what this means is that in our vicinity, we have moderately stable gas, which is not going to be massively fragmenting under the Tumri um, criteria for stability. However, it is worthwhile thinking about this because this is in some sense a self-fulfilling prophecy. Because if we consider the case, for example, where actually the gas um, was highly unstable, what would happen? well, the gas would collapse. We'd get lots of fragmentation. Um, and this would convert gas into stars. So you would um, reduce the surface density of the gas. Um, but also you would heat up the surroundings. Um, you would increase additional velocity dispersion. Um, so if you include that into your sense, which is an additional turbulent supportive force. And that would tend to stabilize the disk. So in effect, for a real disk, it would be hard to be very far um, away from one. Okay. Right. So let's look at some more detail for some of these um, environments in terms of the gas. So at the very center of our galaxy, we have the galactic center, um, which as you all know, contains a supermassive black hole, um, Sagittarius A star, but also, most crucially for our talk here, the central molecular zone. Okay. So this basically is a really large region, lots of mass. It's got 5% of the total molecular gas reservoir of our galaxy, but only within 600 parsecs of the centre. And this equates to a surface density, which is about 100 times higher than the rest of the disk. And to be honest, it's a really interesting region for understanding um, star formation in our galaxy um, for several reasons. Um, one of them being that it's very similar to ultra-luminous infrared galaxies and some of the gas conditions that we see in the early universe just after the Big Bang. So this is an interesting test bed of our understanding of the star formation process. Um, but also just because it allows us to take the theories that we developed from looking at star formation in the disk and put it into a more extreme environment and check that we understand. Because when we look at the temperature of the gas, we find it is much warmer. It's about 70 to 100 Kelvin um, inside the giant molecular clouds. And in the disk, the giant molecular clouds have temperatures about 
10, 20, maybe 30. Um, so it's much warmer. The other difference is that we have highly turbulent line widths, about 10 to 100 kilometers per second. Again, significantly higher um, than we see in nearby molecular clouds. We we'll maybe get one to three kilometers per second, it's occasionally a bit higher, but substantially higher here. Um, we also see, as I said before, a much higher UV field and cosmic reionization rate. And so again, this is this point that where you are in the galaxy matter, star formation here will proceed a bit differently than it will out in a disk. And this galactic um, center is the central molecular zone for the star formation, um, is really affected by the dynamics of the galaxy. So I've got here a nice image um, from a paper by Mattia Sermani, and he's just kind of highlighted the different regions. And we're showing here the gas density um, in the grayscale. So we have the disk with the yellow shaded background. And at the center, you can see the central molecular zone, this kind of sort of little ring. But you can see it is connected to the environment through these dust lanes. And what that basically is, is the bar of our galaxy. And when we look at the star formation in the central molecular zone, um, we find that is actually quite low compared to what our expectation would be. So we are basically creating only about a solar mass per year of stars. And from observational star counting studies, and um, we're fairly certain that that has been constant over the last five mega years. And that's much lower than you would expect just looking at the galaxy. For context, the density of the clouds in this region are about 10 to the four particles per cubic centimeter or higher, which means that they really should be highly unstable and rapidly forming stars. And um, so there is something going on here. Um, best guess is probably some of those factors I mentioned earlier. And um, the fact that we have higher temperatures, which heats the gas, which makes it more stable the fact that we have greater turbulence and that then randomizes things, tears them apart, so adds extra energy, which is harder for the gravity um, to overcome. And we can see that that turbulence within the gas would arise naturally from that connection to the galactic dynamics locally. And because we have this flow of material um, along these dust veins impacting on the central region where it can create shocks and drive turbulence um, within the gas. However, one thing I should say is that we know from looking at other galaxies that um, we do observe star formation rates which are much higher in other galactic centers and that this seems to be quite variable and so one idea would be that mass kind of builds up in the central zone or you get a large and then becomes unstable or every so often you get a large um, clump of material falling along the dust grains from the outer regions of the galaxy. And this triggers a, a burst of star formation, which is much higher. And to understand how the stars form, within the central region. There's a couple of scenarios which have been proposed. Um, one, the kind of conveyor belt theory, that's by um, Steve Longmore. Basically, the idea here would be that we have little clumps of gas in this ring around the galactic center. And when they get to the closest point um, of their orbit to this galactic center, to the central black hole, they get point of maximum compression and that this compression um, triggers star formation within them. There are other theories which are called like the popcorn theory. This is a great name for a theory. I really like it. Um, basically, that's basically saying there's lots of different clouds on in the central molecular zone, and they don't really care. <laughs> They'll just form 
um, on their own um, time scale. And so it doesn't really matter um, where they are in their orbit. If I would say the theory which from extragalactic observations seems to have the most support is that of pearls on a string. And basically, when you look at clouds extragalactically, what you find is that downstream from the ecocenter, so the connection of this dust lane to the ring, that's where you see most of the star formation. And, and that would make sense if material was fed along this bar, hits onto the surface and kind of shocks and is compressed, and that triggers bursts of star formation. And as I said, all of that behavior, so the star formation and the central molecular zone is very much influenced um, by the dynamics of the galaxy. And specifically in this case, um, the bar. So if we look here, this is a, another um, illustration from Mattia. It's just looking at the orbits of the gas within the galactic potential. And you can see how this gives you this different behavior. So basically, a bar is a feature that emerges um, when you have differentially rotating stars and their orbits um, start to get aligned. And so what you have is that these X1, almost elliptical orbits, um, they're shown here as closed, but they're not necessarily in reality things would kind of um, spiral in on the ellipse. Um, and a, the alignment of these orbits is basically gives you the alignment of your bar. Um, so you can see here, this is from one of Matthias' simulations, um, blue is coal gas, red is hot gas, and the stream show, lines show you how the gas rotates in the potential. And you can see that there is this elliptical um, orbit. And at the center of this, that's where we are assembling um, the coal gas. And the bar basically goes like a rotor around your galaxy. However, at some point, as the material spirals in along these um, elliptical orbits, there comes a point um, where that no longer becomes sustainable. Um, it can't get any more narrow and you get a flip and you get a transition to these X2 orbits, which are perpendicular to the main orientation of the bar. And so in this case, your central molecular zone basically links to these X2 orbits. And you can see here, if you zoom down, where you have that transition, here's a nice example here, you can see we're getting shocks and compression. And this can drive star formation in the central zone. And we all can also see that basically this connects the galaxy. What you're doing is you're funneling mass from the star forming disk into the center. And what we can find um, from estimations, from simulations and from observation is that we're basically feeding gas into the galactic center at between 0.8 and 3 solar masses per year. Okay. So let's take another step back and think, what is one of the most recognizable features of a spiral galaxy disk, which will affect the morphology of the gas within the galaxy? And the most obvious thing to say is, of course, that you have um, spiral arms. So the classical um, understanding for how this happened is in density wave theory. Um, so we have here is from Lin and Shu in 1964. And basically the idea is that we have elliptical orbits. They're all slightly turning, you have different rot different rotation of them. And so as they turn at different speeds within the galaxy potential, they overlap and, and they build up. And so you have this um, superposition pattern that comes um, where they overlap. And you can see that nicely here, which is with a series of interact um, elliptical orbits. If you slightly twist um, their major axis, you can see the spiral develop. And so what will happen is that stars and gas will build up where these orbits overlap. And then that further encourages the formation of the spiral arm because, because we have more gas and stars at these set, um, positions in their orbit, that gives us a greater gravitational potential. And the potential of that over density 
causes more nearby gas to fall into the gravity wave, which further increases the density of the interstellar medium in these spiral arms. Of course, in reality, it's not as perfect as that. That's a beautiful mathematical model, which in the context of the interstellar medium generally means that it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> or at the very least, a, a huge, <laughs> a huge simplification. If you want pretty mathematical models, then yeah, you do cosmology. If you want to see how physics intersects, then you study the ISM. Um, we also have, of course, um, more flocculent spiral arms. Which, when researching this um, this lecture, I learned flocculent means flaky, which I, I really like. Uh, so yeah, we have flaky galaxies. And here is where we have spiral arms, which are discontinuous. They're, they're not well defined. And basically the best way to understand this um, is through the self-propagating model of spiral arm formation. So we have down at the bottom here, we can see a nice illustration um, from WADA in um, 2011. And really this is very much the fact that you have gas in the galaxy, <clears throat> it's uh, going to collapse as we will discuss later. And it's differentially rotating, as I said in the introduction. And so what happens is that you have star forming regions which form, they become stretched out by this differential rotation and you end up with these patterns. And this is non-linear evolution, okay? It says bars, which should be spiral arms. <laughs> they're, they're not fixed in time. Um, basically, um, as these regions form, they collapse and they can break apart. They can be torn. And so you can see in this example, at the bottom, we can see what has started out as a continuous um, spiral feature um, stretched out by a differential rotation and um, becomes broken. Um, you get this gap in the middle here and it splits off. And over time, you come back in, you know, another 100 mega years or so, the actual distribution, the orientation of the spirals in this galaxy will be totally different. And um, when we look at galaxies, um, you can find a few which are beautiful examples of grand design spirals. You can find a few which are very, very flocculent. The kind of prototypical one is NGC 2841, which I've shown on the screen. But in reality, you probably see both sets of behavior in that you can have these large scale arms induced by the kind of overlapping orbits. Um, also due to dynamics, if you have a perturbing galaxy outside that can trigger spiral arms. Um, or indeed you can look at the bar if you have a solid rotor bar going down, that can impart resonances where you get a bar basically connecting um, to the edge of the bar. But you're also seeing additional um, spiral features called by the self-propagating um, model. And indeed, when we transfer our understanding to our knowledge of the Milky Way galaxy, we see that that does make sense. When we look at the structure which we deduce for nearby um, arm structure, we can see that it's, it's more complex. There are spurs, there are offshoots, there are arms which don't seem to connect to other arms. And so you're basically getting the combination of these different mechanisms. Okay. So something else which is interesting about spiral arms in the context of star formation and the interstellar medium is the fact that there's a difference in the shear environment within the spiral arm compared to that of the disc in general. So here's a, a nice um, image of the rotation speed um, versus the radius, which I have nicked from a lecture for by Bruce Elmgreen, which I got when I was your age. So ancient history <laughs> from a summer school I went to many years ago. Um, and what you can see this is the rotation curve um, for a galaxy, um, NGC 2998 in this case. And you can see that you have these little bumps and this correlates to where the spiral arms are. 
And within these regions, there's basically no shear. Um, it's almost like you have a little bit of solid body rotation almost within the arm. Okay. And, and so the gravity, when you have material which is in these arms, it is less likely to be pulled apart. Okay. So if you think about it, the spiral arm has its potential. And as the gas enters that potential, it will fall down the potential of the spiral arm. Um, and that will speed it up. When later on, it basically wants to leave, um, that spiral arm has to climb up the potential and that slows it down. Uh, and that basically is why you get this slight decoupling from the rotation of the surrounding galaxy. Um, so just to show you an example of how these spiral arm structures and the fact that you have these kind of self-propagating arms actually equates to a model of the real interstellar medium. Um, this is from one of my own simulations. Um, and what I did was teamed up with an observer, Catherine Zucker. And what we did was we looked at the distribution of the gas when it was embedded within this galactic potential. And we compared the gas structures, which we observed um, to those from observations. And so if you look at the grayscale, this shows you the gas density. And we can see here the different types of spiral arms here. So we have, in this case, I used an analytic potential. So we have these very well-defined spiral arms and we have a very high gas density within them. And so here we can see the long filaments of cold gas which are formed in the arms. And this is the perfect sites um, for forming stars. We can see a little blow up here and you see the blue structures which are identified. And these are very close to real features, which is observed in the interstellar medium, um, which um, have been called the bones of the Milky Way. Not because they actually hold the Milky Way up, just because they're at the center of the spiral arms, like um, bones are within your arm, basically. But between the regions, we also see these long features, which have been stretched out by this differential rotation. And so this almost looks like another spiral it's not well-defined, it's not static in time. And what you're seeing here is that material leaves the arm and it's stretched out between these orbits as it goes into the outer regions. And we can identify clouds in these regions too. Um, but what we do find is that the properties are quite different. Again, showing this dependence on galactic environment. And we'll come back to that later. Um, the other thing you should probably notice is that the galactic arms, the spiral arms, are not entirely smooth. If we look along their edges, um, we get feathering and, and spurs. Um, so little, if you, if I might actually go back one, you can see a nice example here. You can see the material just coming off the spiral arm into these kind of feathered regions. There are a couple of mechanisms which would explain how you can get these. Um, so one method is by wiggle instability, um, which is, yeah, if, if you look at, which is a highly technical term to mean that if you look in isothermal simulations of how galaxies evolve, if you look along the arms, you can see that they get wiggly, which is why we call it the wiggle instability. But this is triggered basically by a combination of two factors. We have the Kelvin Helmholtz instability, because in the arms we have gas that is of higher density than its surroundings, moving at a different velocity. And of course, that triggers the Kelvin Helmholtz instability. But also the fact that once you have um, introduced these perturbations, as I just showed in the previous image, once the material le leaves the arm, it is no longer smooth. It has internal substructure. And you can see um, from this simulation by Wada and Koda in 2004, the Kelvin Helmholtz instability along the, war the arms, but also how this is imparted structure on the interarm regions, which then when it next enters uh, a spiral arm, will fall into the center 
of the spiral alarm potential. That will cause a shock, which will compress the gas further. And that will amplify these perturbations. So over time, these wiggles will get more prominent in time. And so that's one way of getting these feathers and spurs. Um, but I should stress that this is from kind of isothermal um, simulations. The other way which you get them um, is all illustrated in this simulation um, by Dobbs and Bunnell in 2006, is again, simply the shearing, the fact that you have differential rotation. And so basically what happens as, as a gas falls into the potential of your spiral arm, <clears throat> when it leaves that arm, it will be on different orbits. And depending on the initial angle of momentum, that will, as it climbs up the potential well again, put it onto um, a different orbital path. And what happens then is that as the gas leaves the spiral arm from this low shear environment to the higher shear environment in the interarm region, you get the structure kind of torn apart. And you can see that here. Here's the material within the arm. As it exits the arm, the differential rotation pulls it back. It's got a longer orbital path and therefore the material which is um, closer to the galactic center um, is rotating faster. And so we get this stretched out. And so we get that kind of shear and feathers and spurs um, in the arms. And that is an interesting environment um, for star formation. And I would say one where we don't, haven't maybe really put enough emphasis on our understanding about what the shear flows will do in those environments to the internal turbulence, for example. Okay. Okay, and here's just another um, example um, to show you. Um, this is from a simulation by Ana Duarte Cabral. And again, you can clearly see here the gas moving between the arms, between these spiral arms um, passages. And as a, I'm gonna show, you can see that um, the density distribution in these regions um, does matter for their internal dynamics for how the gas is compressed and how this can lead to star formation. Okay, um, so this is just an example showing you that. This is again from that simulation I showed you earlier, where we're looking at the properties of the giant molecular filaments, that's the clouds we see in the interarm regions, compared with those of the bones. And we can see that they have different conditions. But what we find is that in order to explain the properties of these two different classes of molecular star forming cloud, we found that in the interarm regions, you could explain all the properties of the clouds without invoking gas self gravity. In other words, these were structures which were gravitationally unbound. Whereas when you looked in the spiral arms, you can only explain their properties if they are strongly bound, if they have strong gravity and they are collapsing under that gravity. And so again, we can see a difference in the star forming properties depending on the galactic dynamics. Okay. And the final region really I just want to talk about before we have a little break, because um, I'm sure you're tired of me talking. Um, <laughs> and, and is the outer galaxy. Um, so for the more part, most part, um, we focus on set galaxy centers where we have star formation. Um, but as you go out um, further and further in the galaxy, and we get to this very low density environment and the outer regions. Um, so this is from a simulation which of, of mine, which is just a recent one. And you can see that in the inner disk, we have these um, spiral arm features. We have dense gas where we get molecular material. But as you go to the outer galaxy, we're still in a reasonably high shear environment, but just the absolute surface density is lower. And so because of that, we have um, less cold molecular gas. It's a lower metallicity. 
And because there is less star formation, it's also a lower interstellar radiation field. Um, however, we do still find um, star formation proceeding out these enormous little islands um, and the outer disk. Uh, and so this is also an interesting environment and one we shouldn't entirely forget. And the final thing I want to talk to you about, about the different environments of the Milky Way, is just to go back to that how I started this section, which was to look at the fact that this is all embedded within a dark matter halo. Because when we consider how the galaxy evolves, how the interstellar medium um, in the galaxy evolves, we shouldn't forget that the gas will ultimately be consumed by star formation. Now, on a large time scale, but it will be consumed by star formation. And the fact that we do see relatively continuous star formation in diff galaxies is because we do have streams of new material being accreted onto the galaxy from the outside. So we have these tidal streams. These can be both gaseous and stellar. Here's some nice examples of some stellar streams here. But in terms of the gas, the most important is the Magellanic stream for our Milky Way. And this connects um, the SMC, the LMC, the small and large Magellanic clouds. And we get this stream of gas, um, which is connecting from them onto the corona of the Milky Way, where it could possibly be accreted by the Milky Way, can be rained down onto the disk and fuel future generations um, of star formation. Okay, so I think this is a good point for a little break. We have looked in this section at the different environments in the Milky Way, and we've looked at um, how that might alter the creation of dense star forming clouds. Um, in these environments. Are there any questions at this point before we move on? Well, thanks for the lecture so far and for this little tour of our galaxy. Uh, I guess you have a timer, but just so you know, we're about 50 minutes in. That's fine. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop when I stop, it's good. <laughs> I won't go over. <laughs> okay, so are there questions? Um, yeah, could you again explain what causes this um, inside-out growth exactly? Uh, because what I understood is that you undergo friction and then you lose energy and move uh, inwards. So um, is it because of this wiggle instability? Um, so which slide is it you're talking about? The... Um, you mentioned a few times um, that there's this inside-out growth, and I was wondering what exactly causes, causes it. The, do you mean the Kelvin Helmholtz, this one? Um, no, no, it was not on a specific slide. I think you uh, said it a few times. Inside out growth. Uh, inside out growth of what? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm um, for example, that um, um, sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's probably me. <laughs> Yeah, are we are we talking about the the arms, about the the gas, or the? Uh, yeah, exactly. That um um everything um grows, for example. In in terms of the density. No, no. In terms of, of size, um, maybe I misunderstood something. Oh, that's the. Like... Yeah. Uh... Okay, so there is no no such thing as inside out growth, of galaxies. Oh, they, I mean, in, in terms of the, the density distribution increasing or the, yeah, maybe, why don't, we, why don't we have a chat about this after? Because I think I have clearly not understood, uh, I have not explained something well enough. So maybe we could have a chat afterwards and we can work out um what, what I've said, <laughs> which is wrong, okay? Okay, uh, yeah, okay. Thank you. Any other questions? If you want to clarify your question, maybe you can write it on the Slack. Uh, yeah, that would be great. Want to read it later. Yeah. Other questions? It's over there, yes. Uh, 
Um, thank you for the talk. Um, I think it's on the bar slide. There is an X1 orbit and the X2 orbit. Yeah. I might have missed it. Could you please tell me uh, why the shift happens, the transition between the orbits? Yeah, basically, I think there's only, I, I'm not, this is actually not my perfect expertise. It's the Matthias Amani is more, it's more the expert. Um, but yeah, my understanding is that once you get, it gets too narrow, um, it, it doesn't become sustainable anymore. And essentially what happens is that it becomes almost self-fulfilling because once you start to get these X2 orbits forming, then once the material goes on the X1, they, they overlap. Um, and where you have the intersection between them, that causes this material to shock. So it loses energy, it loses angular momentum, and that encourages the this shift to the X2 um, orbit. Of course, you need to get this um, settled in the first place. Um, and it's just at this certain point, this becomes more energetically favorable. Thank you. Maybe one last question. So um, since the cloud in the interarm regions is mostly unbounded, right? Yeah. What, what you wrote on your slide. So what's the star formation activity around there? Like, is there any star formation at all in the interarm regions? Because I... I have seen some work like before that there there are some star formation. Yes, there is. How could that um, be? That's because I, I I'll come on to this more um as we go in the lecture, but the question is on what scale. So globally, the clouds are unbound. However, that doesn't mean that that's true of everything within them. So the density distribution within the cloud. Um, it has a log normal form. And so that means that there will be parts within the cloud which are bound. So you have little local over densities within the clouds and you can get star formation um, proceeding within those regions um, just fine. Um, but if you look at the larger scale clouds, you know, if you're talking about a region you know, 10 parsecs or something, you will see, yeah, it's globally unbound but individual subregions within it actually are bound. Um, and I, you see this in my simulations, actually. You can get stars forming quite nicely um, in unbound clouds. It's caused you to have these little subregions within them. Thank you. There's another question over there. Or wrong. Shall we make this the last question? It sounds good. Hello, um, thank you very much for the talk. So regarding the spiral arms, you said that in the spiral arms, we have um, solid body rotation, while in the rest of the disc, we have differential rotation. It's, so it's not you... quite solid body, but yeah, it, it's there is less shear. Yeah, okay. So my question would be, so what's the physical reason for that? It, it just because of the, the potential. So basically, um, as you fall into the potential or you can think about in terms of, you know, basically you, you'll speed up because they will, as you pull down and, and your, your orbit as you go in and then as you leave the potential, you have to climb up and that slows you down. And what that does is it tends to make the angular um, the rotation more similar um, within that region because you kind of lose it, you know, you gain energy coming in and lose energy going out and, and that makes it more similar. Yeah, thank you. So I guess uh, we can continue with the lecture if you want. Sounds good. Okay. Right. Um, so let's look at how we then assemble molecular clouds within the galaxy um, given this environment. Okay. So I am, um, you may have seen, I'm not sure how much you, you've talked so far about the interstellar medium, how much you know already, probably a lot. 
Um, but it's probably worthwhile just giving um, a little introduction. Um, so as you know, there are at least five dermal phases, depending on who you talk to, um, in the interstellar medium. And all of them have different properties. Um, so the hotter scale, we have the hot interstellar medium. Um, and this is heated from shocks, um, cools via x-rays, um, and very hot ionized material. Then we'll have the warm phase um, of ionized and neutral um, hydrogen. Here, the main heat source is photoionization from surroundings. It's cooled by atomic lines. And on smaller scales, we get the colder material, we get the cold neutral medium heated by photoelectric electrons from dust. And on the smallest, coldest regions where we get the stars, we have the molecular clouds, where we have temperatures of only just above 10 Kelvin when they're first born, and um, number densities in excess of 100 particles um, per cubic centimetre. And this basically um, is the fundamental nature of the ISM and really depends on how you can form stars within it. And the fact that we have these distinct phases is very much connected to the fact that there is a thermal instability. And I've got some curves here. Uh, basically, this becomes because of the details for how the gas can cool. Um, so once you get to a certain density, um, we have the fact that the gas is cooled by emission from lines and from, from atoms. And that when you get to the high density material, these transitions are driven by collisions. And so as you get more collisions, the molecules rotate more, then as they'll slow down again, they'll emit a little photon, which will carry away energy. And so the more collisions which you can give your molecules, then the more efficiently they can cool. And so instead of, as you would expect from an ideal gas, um, that when you squeeze um, the gas, it would get hotter, into the interstellar medium, once you reach a critical level, as you squeeze it, the gas gets colder because you trigger more of these collisions um, and enhance the cooling rate. So it will square with um, N squared. And that's what gives you this behavior. Because if we think about how the gas sits, we can think of it in terms of a pressure equilibrium. Because um, if we have a higher pressure or a lower pressure, that will compress the gas or it would cause it to expand. And so we have to have a constant pressure throughout um, the interstellar medium. And that will be determined by the density and the temperature. And so you can see here on the left, this little unstable state where we have a warm neutral medium which has temperatures of about 10 to the 4 Kelvin. And then, as that's uh, up here, where are we? Yeah, here, <laughs> pressure. Um, the warm neutral medium um, density increases, the pressure increases, and we get to this unstable region here, where you get this transition between material which is hot, so lots of thermal pressure, and diffuse to a region which is cold, so less thermal temperature, but dense, and so you have lots of collisions. And these two regions um, are in pressure equilibrium with each other. And so you can think you get this kind of runaway process that once you get to this critical level, of density, the pressure um, keeps increasing within the region, um, uh, but that energy is being carried away 
Um, so you get the gas getting colder. And so you have this equilibrium curve where you get this kind of unstable regime between the two. Okay. Right. So if we think about the size scale of this thermal instability, so if we want some gas which is isobaric, must be able to maintain pressure equilibrium. And so we think about a representative um, temperature. So we've just shown from the hold on, from the, the previous plot, we can see that once you've gone through this instability, your number density is of around 100 and temperatures of about um, 100 Kelvin, sorry. That's not, let me just show that again, that's better. Yeah. So if you if you look here at the bottom, you can see you're at temperatures of about 100 Kelvin. The sound speed on the gas there is about a kilometers per second. In the interstellar medium, the cooling rate through C plus, and that density is about 1.1 times 10 to the minus 27 Earths per centimeter cube per second. And if you work out the cooling time, given this cooling rate and our standard expression for just thermodynamics for cooling time, we can work out that we will have cooling rate, um, which is shown here. Um, so if we have a number density of um, one, for example, it would be 600,000 mega years. But that density, it's more like um, a number density of 100. And so we have a cooling time scale, which would only about 6,000 years or so. So very, very short, very rapid cooling. When we look at the size scale of those perturbations, we find they're actually quite small. Um, and so what we find is that through this thermal instability, you can create cold gas within the interstellar medium. However, the size scales of these perturbations to first order are quite small. So there must be additional um, things going on here. So in reality, the size scale of the gas which you get through the thermal instability will depend on the detailed balance between the heating and cooling within the interstellar medium, as well as the initial temperature of the gas and also the size scale of the initial perturbation. So I'll show here on the right um, from an old work by Burker and Lynn, if we have an overdensity, which is some sort of perturbation, which has been introduced into a medium which can become thermally, um, thermally unstable, basically this shaded region where shows where the perturbation can grow in a non-linear manner. And here we see the size scale, okay? And so between these regimes for different gas densities, you get different scales of structure emerging. And um, I think the key point to take away here is that the sky scales which grow are initially quite small. And so thermal instability on its own, while it can create dense gas, while it can keep dense gas um, stable, is not really the main driver of how individual molecular clouds are forming. Um, there is additional stuff going on. Okay, so let's have a bit more information about the heating and cooling in the interstellar medium. Um, so this plot here has a lot of lines on it. <laughs> I would suggest if you're interested um, to go have um, a look yourselves later um, on the slides. Um, nonetheless, it actually does summarize just about all of the major processes um, which determine thermal balance um, within the interstellar medium. And I want you to look at these things and think about how they might vary with di different um, galactic environment. So the reds and the oranges or yellows, these are heating terms. And so we can see at the lower densities, um, we're dominated by photoelectric um, heating and UV pumping. And um, basically what we're seeing, um, photo association, we're seeing the impact of the surrounding radiation field. So this is from the UV emission from ionizing hot young stars, which is reprocessed through the dust. 
And that's the major thing that's heating up the gas. At these lower density, most of the cooling is coming from atomic line transitions. And um, so we can see here the C plus, that's this line here, and the CO, which will come in later. Now you see there is this transition here where the cooling is coming from atomic lines mainly. And we also have a little bit of oxygen line cooling down here. And then it abruptly falls down around densities between 100 and 1,000 in number densities. What's happening here is that the atomic um, carbon is being converted into molecular hydrogen. And so well, that would be impressive. Molecular carbon, so we have CO um, here. And that's where we have these molecular line cooling. And that takes over about these number densities and will be the main coolant within molecular clouds between about number densities of 1,000 and 10 to the 5. OK, so major coolant in the diffuse gas of the galaxy is atomic lines. Within molecular clouds, it's molecular lines. And then when you get to the very highest densities where individual cores and stars are forming, um, then you'll find that dust cooling um, takes on over. Um, throughout this, for the most part, the most important heating is um, the interstellar radiation field. However, it is worth thinking, noting that at the high mass end, that does eventually change. And actually, cosmic rays become increasingly important. Um, but also um, shock heating um, uh, and heating from compression once you start to cool less effectively. Okay, so these are basically the different cooling terms um, within the interstellar medium. And the thing to highlight here is you can see that these are dependent in many ways on metallicity and dust to gas ratio. And as I highlighted in the introduction, we saw that those things are not constant everywhere in the galaxy. So we have um, a higher gas to dust, sorry, we have a higher metallicity at the center. And then as you go out, that metallicity gets steadily lower. I would say that the gas to dust ratio is something which is um, less clear, less well understood. And both in terms of its variation within our galaxy and also its variation in other galaxy systems and across cosmic time, that is still something which is um, less known and I'm not an expert on. Okay. So once we have the heating and cooling, which is going to determine the thermal temperature of the gas, we can then look at what is going to determine how the gas becomes unstable and might form these clouds. So the most obvious thing to start with is the genes instability, which um, I'm sure, again, you've probably seen in your undergraduates. So this is basically just determined and derived from the balance of the internal thermal pressure which is balances out against the mass of gravity um, pushing against it. Okay, And then if gravity wins, we get perturbations, which will have a characteristic genes mass, which depends on the density and the temperature. Um, notice that the temperature is more important than the density. That goes to the power of three halves, whereas the density only goes to the power of a half. And then... From this, you can equate that into a characteristic size scale, a radius, and then that this will collapse on the free fall time scale. Again, the thing to note is that this free fall time scale is then dependent on density. And so it's nonlinear, it's runaway collapse, because once you increase the density, that time scale for collapse um, increases faster. And so you get this accelerating collapse once everything becomes unstable. Okay, 
And so let's think about how that equates in the actual interstellar mediation field. So in the actual interstellar medium, in terms of the size scales of the genes mass and the lengths of our densities that would be produced. So on the length here, um, on this slide, I've just basically shown um, a plot which shows you from one of my own simulations of the interstellar medium, we have the number density of the gas in the bottom. We have the temperature along the left axis. And we can see the distribution of phase space um, here. And so we have our hot ionized medium up here. Then we have um, our warm um neutral medium and then we can see we fall down this instability to where we get the cold gas okay so if we look at the genes mass and um, which is shown here in log you can see there's an absolutely huge range in the genes mass and so once you get to number densities of about um number densities of one which is the average um, density roughly between one and 10 in the galactic disk, we can see that we have genes masses of between 1,000 to 10 to the 4 solar masses and gas. And actually, that corresponds um, really well with the sorts of masses that we see um, for nearby um, molecular clouds. Um, it's a bit smaller than what we would see in extragalactic observations, but in extragalactic observations, often you're merging a lot of smaller structures together um, in your beam. And so that corresponds well locally with the masses. Um, if we look here in terms of the size scales that that equates to, we're talking at those densities about 100 or so, something which is a length scale of, you know, roughly... 10 ish parsec. Um, and again, that correlates well with the sort of size scales um, that we see for nearby molecular clouds. And so I think to, to nobody surprised, um, gravity is a good way of collapsing um, gas together to form molecular clouds. And so in this case, you have the thermal instability, which gets you cold enough to get to these temperatures. And so rather than basically setting the size scale of the perturbation, what the thermal instability is doing is giving you cool gas, and then that cool gas um, can collapse under gravity. However, it is worth noting, as I said, that this is a nonlinear process. Because if you look on the smaller size scales, you know, if we're going up to densities before 10 to the four particles per cubic centimeter, then we have genes masses, which are about one, which of course is similar to the mass of stars, the mass of, of star forming cores. And so we see that this doesn't just determine, it's not like you, you form a, a cloud and then you're done. If you have additional substructure within a molecular cloud, then that itself can of course collapse and becomes genes unstable. And so you'll get lots of different levels of collapse within a, a, a single region. Um, from gravity. But all of this would be seeded from the outside by the large scale motions. Okay. And as I said, this all depends on the different metallicity environment you're in. This is a plot um, from Omakai et al. in 2005, and it looks at the temperature density curves um, for different metallicities in the gas. Um, so solar metallicity it is down here. And so you can see where you get this kind of bump in the distribution. It is altered. So these are the dotted line shows you basically constant genes masses. And so when you're in different density, temperature, metallicity environments, um, you get the fragmentation happening at different scales, and that will affect how star formation can proceed in the interstellar medium. Okay. Okay. So something else um, from the galaxy, which can affect how 
molecular clouds are formed and how they then fragment into stars is looking at magnetic fields. <clears throat> and just shown here two nice examples. This is M51. It's a polarization map. And you can probably see the, the lines here. This is a technique which allows you to visualize the orientation of the magnetic field. And what you can quite clearly see is that the strength of the field tends to follow the alignment of the arms. And when we look within our own galaxy, this is a map from Planck. It shows you the dust polarization and uses again that to map out the magnetic field. Again, you can see that there is this alignment in that the magnetic fields tends to follow the orientation um, of the gas structures. I should say, though, just as an aside, that is only up until a certain level. Once you get to very high densities, you do find a decoupling. And that actually, the orientation of the field tends to flip from parallel to perpendicular. And again, that might be taken as evidence of how the gas is collapsing in these systems with it flowing along the field lines to, to come together. So this is something else which varies throughout the galaxy. So here's some results from um, simulations in blue. In blue, shows you the magnetic field strength along the y-axis. And along the x-axis, we have the radius um, from different simulations, from the Aurega simulations in this case. And the red and the black line shows you some points um, from observations of other extragalactic sources. The major point that you can clearly here, see here is that the field is higher at the center and so be more dominant in these regions. Okay. Something else which we learn um, from simulations is that we see that there is this energy equipartition between the kinetic energy of the gas um, and the magnetic energy. Um, so these are some simulations I show at the bottom um, from my um, former PhD student. He's now out being a, <laughs> being a postdoc, David Whitworth. And, and it's showing you the balance between the magnetic energy in blue, the kinetic energy in red um, for this dwarf galaxy. And we can see that there is this balance between the energy in both. You get energy basically transferred between the one and the other. And so in terms of shaping the interstellar medium, it's the magnetic fields will play almost as important a role as the kinetic energy does. And that just gives this extra pressure force that the galaxy will experience, um, gas in the galaxy will experience. And as I said, that is correlated with a large scale um, orientation of the field, which itself is related to the gas density distribution. And that just makes that clear. So in blue here, we have turbulent energy of the gas compared to in black, the magnetic energy. So this is the total field. And in green, we have much lower the, the ordered um, field. The important thing to book here is that I've talked about the thermal energy, but actually this kinetic energy is at least as important in shaping the interstellar medium. I'm going to skip over the park instability in terms of times. So where does this turbulence in the in the galaxy come from? Um, it's coming from feedback and it's coming from large scale instabilities in the disk. And um, it's coming from the fact that you have repeated spiral arm passages. The fact that you have these shear environments I've just talked about as you exit the spiral arms, which stir up the gas. And the other thing it's coming from is you get these repeated supernovae. If you remember back to when I showed you the introduction, we had these super bubbles, which were driving structure um, within the gas. And so that these expansions are basically stirring up the surroundings. They're adding kinetic energy, which will determine how the future gas evolves. And that's due to 
this large scale um, distribution. And so putting that together, how do we form these um, star forming clouds in a galactic context? Well, first of all, we have um, spiral arms. The gas falls into the arm, becomes compressed, like I showed you, and we get these dense clouds forming along the arms. But when we have clouds, which are on different orbits, which are falling in and out of these spiral arms, which are being pushed around um, by supernovae, what can happen is that the clouds can collide. And so cloud-cloud collisions, there's a nice um, picture as shown here from Fukui et al. Um, you can have a look at that there. And basically in this idea is you'll get two clouds where the gas is mainly atomic. They will collide with each other for any of these regions. And as they do that, that compresses this compressed layer. And when you compress the gas, you basically trigger that thermal instability, which I just told you. And so you end up with dense gas at the center. And you can see that because of this, you have dense gas forming, it will be genes unstable. And because of this violent process, it will have also have a lot of internal kinetic energy. And if it's had internal substructure, it will have random motions within it. And so this cloud will also be um, highly turbulent. And all that is seeded by the large scale dynamics. And so how the gas is brought together by the galaxy will then set the initial conditions for the star formation, um, which follows on from it, and which you're going to look at a bit more um, later um, in your lecture series. Okay, and just to finish off, um, it's a nice simulation. Um, we can see where we've modeled some of these forces, all the ideas I've put together to you, looking at the thermal distribution of the gas, um, looking at the large scale potential, the heating, the cooling, how grass becomes unstable and fragments has been included in these models of a galaxy. We've looked at one which is interacting, we've looked at one which is isolated. And you can see that when you include those processes, we have a highly structured interstellar medium. You can see the density distribution here. And we can see these clouds which correlate with the locations of spiral arms and features. We can then identify molecular clouds in these simulations where we have all these physics in much the same way that you would in observations. And then we can look at how the different properties of the clouds varies with different environments. This is work done by um, Robin Tress. And what we can see in this case was in terms of the masses of clouds, there wasn't much difference depending on where you were in the disk. But we found much more massive clouds at the galactic center. The other thing we found was that this complex formation process resulted in clouds which were mainly unbound, as I mentioned in the question. But when you zoomed into the small scale structure, which was triggered by this galactic formation process, you find smaller regions which do become locally bound. And so what Robin's done here is he's created a tree of the structure of the gas. We see the dendrograms here. And look to the virial ratio. So that's basically the ratio between the supportive forces and gravity. So basically kinetic um, velocity dispersion, the internal turbulence, the thermal energy versus the pull of gravity. And what you can see is that it's only on the smallest scale of the regions, these little substructures within the gas, where you find that gravity becomes the strongest. And so this galactic origin has related in globally unbound clouds um, for the most part. Okay, and this is something which I myself um, use. Um, I've got my own 
um, simulation suite, which I call the Cloud Factory. And again, what we do is we take, we take galaxy scale simulations and we follow the formation of gas down to the very smallest scales within it. And so here I've looked at different methods in which the supernova turbulence might be affecting the gas. And we extract clouds from it and look at different environments like a spiral arm, which you might find here, or a region which has really been stirred by previous generations of star formation is highly turbulent. And what we find is when we zoom down into these high resolution clouds, we find that there are differences in the gas structure, which is imparted by this different um, galactic scale formation. So for example, this one at the top left, that's a region that's formed in a spiral arm. And you can see that we have these long filamentary structures um, within the gas distribution. Um, on the contrast, when we look at this other region down here, this is a region which there's been a strong previous burst of supernova feedback. It's from a more interarm region. Um, it's just come out, there's, been a lot of supernova from a previous generation of star formation is just forming and we can see that the structure is quite distinct so the filaments are longer in the potential dominated case where we didn't have so much previous um, feedback where there was a strong spiral arm potential which the gas fell into and here the gas was more coherent and we can see that in the velocity dispersion uh, this then alters the fragmentation of the gas into stars within it. This shows you the mass to length ratio of the filaments which form in these different clouds in different galactic environments. And basically, anything over this gray line here will be more susceptible to fragmentation um, against thermal support. And what we find here is that for the region which has been in the spiral arm, where it was quite quiescent initially, all of the gas along the filament reaches this criteria for fragmentation almost at the same time. And so you get lots of fragments, large clusters forming along the spiral arm, you get very rapid star formation, and you get these dense massive clusters forming along the spiral arm. Whereas on the other hand, um, when we look at these other galactic environment um, where there was this previous you know, highly turbulent medium from previous generations were not in the center of a spiral arm, we found that the star formation, um, this criteria for fragmentation was not reached everywhere in the cloud. It was just reached in some parts at different times. And so you end up with star formation history in this cloud, which is more um, distributed and more sequential. So we have a um, slower star formation and we get different types of stellar clusters which are built from this in these different environments. Okay, um, so I'm going to stop here and we'll just take some questions and in the interest of time I think we'll probably mainly bring the, the lecture to an end here so just if you have any questions now I think it would be a good time to do that and to end the lecture. All right, thank you. Or do you want me to talk for long? I can talk for long if you want to have another section. I just <laughs> we still have uh, we still have half an hour for the end. Oh, well, then that's fine. We'll, we'll talk. Um, that's so great. We can do some questions, and if you want, I was thinking that we finished at um the three, but if we've got more time, we'll keep going. But let's have questions in this section first, and then you can tell me how much time I have, and I'll adjust. Yeah, let's do that. Um, thank you. Uh, so when you showed those, that work with um, your simulations with Robin Tress mm -hmm. and um, finding bound structures with high density, I was mm -hmm. wondering if that boundedness corresponds also to um, a physical scale or if you're mostly seeing that in density space. And yeah, it's a, there is a physical scale to it. Um, it's about a parsec or so, a couple of parsecs. Um, but smaller than the 10 kiloparsec size um, of the molecular clouds themselves. So if we think about the hierarchy of the interstellar medium, that's more at the clump size scale rather than the cloud size scale. 
So it's looking like the clouds, which are about 10 parsec, uh, mean number density between 100 and 1,000, those were mainly unbound. It's the clumps within them, which have densities above 1,000. Um, well, yeah, you can well, you can see that here, <laughs> 100 to 1,000. Um, but they're smaller size scale, they're about a parsec or so. And they're the bound structures. Thank you. Any other questions? Anybody? Yes. So based on your simulation results, would it be untrue or would it be fair to say that star formation is equally as light or not as likely, but is possible within the interarm regions as within the arms just on a different you know the amount of stars being formed is, is much smaller i would say that once you've formed a cloud and um, you've done that cloud formation process um it's probably as likely to form stars in an arm as an interarm region that that seems to be what the observations are showing us that the properties of the clouds themselves are not that different what does seem to be different is it's much harder to form a cloud which then contains dense substructure which could be bound in the interarm region than it is in the arm region. So it's more like getting the structure, the star forming cloud in the first place is harder in an interarm environment than it is in an arm. Thank you. Um, is it then, so the potential for massive star formation in the interarm regions is then still just sampling the same theoretical IMF then? Yeah. Um, that might be a hard question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it's still a contested. What you definitely need to form massive stars is a lot mass. <laughs> that that really helps in a deep potential well. Um, you have more chances to do it because you have more clouds and it's a higher density environment within a spiral arm. It is still possible in the interarm regions. Um but that certainly does seem to be um, a vapor which would certainly favor massive star formation. However, there is really no strong variation um, evidence for variation in a stellar um, initial mass function within the galaxy disk. Admittedly, we've not been able to go out too far, um, but where we see locally the initial mass function, which of course um, would be different if there was a different um, likelihood of forming um, massive stars, that seems the same locally. Where we might be seeing differences is, again, the galactic center. Um, um, several different reasons for that. We've got more um, higher temperatures, um, higher densities, and we just talked about that will affect how the gas can fragment um, to form stars. Um, so that could influence your potential for forming massive stars. It could also change the low mass end of your initial mass function. Different turbulence can um, change your ability to form low mass objects. Um, but that's 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 a question for another day. <laughs> All right, so other questions, yes. Hi, Rowan. Thank you. Hi. Uh, nice talk. Uh, I was wondering about the dwarf galaxy simulations that you showed uh, with the equipartition. Um, is this the total kinetic energy that you reach equipartition with? Um, yeah. Um, it, it's the kinetic energy in the, the vertical direction. Oh, okay. So... Uh, this is a, a proxy for calculating the turbulence, right? Yeah, basically. Yeah. So, so do you have a dynamo there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a self-generating um ma magnetic field. Um, so you have the small-scale dynamo, which is from supernova feedback, which is actually resolved because we've we we because a dwarf we can go to really high resolution, mm -hmm. which is which is which is good fun and then we follow this for like a giga year so we can get the establishment of the large scale dynamo from the rotation of the galaxy um so yeah so that forms and the, the different um there's three panels here 
I don't think that shows you basically different um, initial field strengths. And um, so the one on the right, you start with a saturated field. The other two, you, you grow up from a lower level, but the behavior is similar. The interesting thing is in these in this simulation, the magnetic field does not globally suppress star formation. It's absolutely the same with and without the magnetic field. And um, that's the fun part. Cool. Thank you. Is there another question before we give Rowan a few more minutes? Yeah. Well, to do 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, as many minutes as you want. Tell me how many you want. I have slides and I will bring it to stop. <laughs> <laughs> no questions? Well, you're still going to have the occasion to ask questions after. So we have, um, so we should finish by 20 past. Sure. Uh, so if you want to allow a few more minutes for questions yeah, yeah. Right at the end, maybe yeah. you can just spend uh, 10 minutes uh, for the Yeah, I'll spend about 15 minutes. Sorry, I got my timing wrong because I thought you wanted me to end on the hour. So that was why. But okay. um, that's all good. OK, um, let's talk about filaments. OK, so the reason why I'm talking about this is because I have been talking about the large scale um, galactic structure. And I think one of the things which we have really appreciated is in recent years is the connection between this large scale galaxy structure and the smaller scales within them. So, so far in this lecture, we have talked about the different galactic environments and we then have talked about how that can alter how and where molecular clouds will form and their mass, their internal temperatures um, and velocity dispersions by those galactic environments. Um, so the question really is, is then there a decoupling between those smaller scales? Does it matter once you've formed your cloud what that original galactic environment would be? And I think something we're seeing is that actually there is a connection. So this is basically um, something I've taken from a review which we did of the filamentary um, interstellar medium for protoplanets um, and protostars and planets series. Um, it's the review is all online, so you can read it if you fancy it. I'll put a link. And when we look at different structures between the interstellar medium, we can see that there is this common geometry, this filamentary um, star formation. So along here, we have the bottom. This is the Nessie um, infrared dark cloud. Um, and basically, that is one of these bones that I've been telling you about. That is a very long molecular cloud, which is right in the center of a spiral arm. And then when we look at other molecular clouds um, in the interstellar medium, we can see that this filamentary geometry is present in all of them, but it's present at different scales. So here we have the um, a galactic filament here, that's a couple of parsecs long. Here we have a nearby molecular cloud, and we can see this filamentary structure. And in these nearby clouds where we can actually resolve down to even smaller scales, what you find is that once you go into this cloud, you can see that there are smaller substructures and that these substructures are themselves filamentary. So in every scale we look in our galaxy, we are seeing this geometry. And so what we did um, for this um, analysis was we basically tried to combine all the observations of filaments everywhere in our galaxy um, and look at their properties and the scales which they're on. And so this is the results of the analysis. This is the mass of the filamentary structures um, versus their length along the y-axis. And what you can see is that there is this continuous distribution. Um, wherever you look, in the interstellar medium, wherever you, um, whatever size scale you're sensitive, you see this relationship between the mass and the length. 
and it goes all the way up between the size scale of individual star forming cores, right up to this tumory length. So that's the very sad, that very upper level here is set by that large scale galactic dynamics. And in between, you have this continuous um, distribution of structure. And it obeys this characteristic um, stability law. So if we think in much the same way that you have our genes mass for stability in a 3D distribution, um, when you're in a 2D distribution of filament, um, you can find a characteristic mass um, where the gas will be unstable. And in, for a filament, that's a line mass. So the mass divided by the length. And this dotted black line shows the one where you have thermal um, motion supporting. But when you add in um, supersonic motions from internal turbulence, you get this red curve here. Okay, that's this one here. And that pretty much sets the bottom end of our um, distribution. Anything that comes across this will start to become gravitationally unstable and will fragment and form stars. This boundary here is basically between the molecular filaments and the atomic ones, and that's set by the, the ability of gas to shield itself from the interstellar radiation field. And so we can see that across the scales, we have the scaling of the velocity dispersion. And then we're looking at the larger structures. They don't sit across the thermal, um, the thermal line. They have supersonic motion, supersonic velocity dispersion. And so there'll be shocks within them. But the reason I wanted to talk about this in the lecture is because you can see that this is a hierarchical process. So here we have the mass to length plot, which I've just shown you, but we've highlighted different regions in nearby star forming clouds in different colors. So in blue, we have the cyan, and that's the Ryan cloud. And so that's the large scale Orion cloud itself. That's the smaller filaments within it. And that's these subfilaments or fibers on the very smallest scale. And you can see that these lie along distinct lines and that they're nested. And so what that's showing you is that you have this nested substructure within these regions, which connects the small scale structure up to the size scale of the cloud itself and therefore to the galactic environment in which it is embedded. And this is important because again, what we find is that a lot of these regions are not independently gravitationally inbound. Instead, they might be pressure confined. If we look at filaments, this is some small scale structures, but you see it on a larger scale as well. This is a map showing you the observed velocity. So we have red shifted velocities on one side, we have blue shifted velocities on the other. What you're seeing is that there is a converging motion across the filament. And so what does this actually equate to? It equates of a flow of material coming from the outside onto the inside. In other words, we have a flow of material from the large scale of the galaxy down to the small, a conveyor belt of mass to grow your clouds and to feed the star formation um, within them. And this is particularly true of the massive filaments, which we see embedded in higher column density um, environments. And so what we have is a process of accretion that once the molecular filament and the molecular cloud is created, that doesn't mean it's ended. The gravity, the galaxy doesn't wait for one process to begin before the to end before the next one begins. Everything happens everywhere, everywhere, all at once, and um, to quote the movie. And so 
while you have a star formation embedded within a cloud, you still have these accretion flows onto it from the environment that perhaps formed it in the first time. And this flow of gas from the large scale to the small scale by these converging motions, it can drive internal turbulence in the cloud, which will then further support it and determine how it, it evolves. And what's really interesting is that when you look at the time scales of this, you can see that the flow of material, the accretion onto the cloud itself is setting the normalization of where the cloud sits in this hierarchy, in this mass to length relation, where it sits um, within the global distribution of clouds within the galaxy. So here's the clouds I showed you earlier when I was talking about the hierarchy of structure. So on the bottom, we have Orion, on the top, we have Musca, which is a kind of prototypical filamentary cloud. Um, it's very well defined and easy to study. And you can see that these curves, these lines, are at different points within this full distribution. What determines where you're lying? Well, when we did our meta-analysis of the Milky Way, we found that you could describe this by the balance between two time scales. On one scale, you have the accretion time scale. That's the time for gas to be accreted from the galaxy, um, either through these converging cloud throws by a cloud cloud collision, and um, by material falling into a spiral arm being channeled onto one of these forming clouds, whichever mechanism you have. But that gives you an accretion rate. And from that, you can work out the time scale for the accretion. You know, how quickly you are building mass, new mass onto the filament, how quickly you're building up the filamentary cloud. And on the other hand, that is balanced by the fragmentation time scale. And so, as I've talked about, once you exceed a critical mass to length ratio, the gas becomes gravitationally unstable and that is not a smooth collapse. What you'll find is that different perturbations will grow faster than the others. And so that will relate to fragmentation along the, the filament structure. And so you have this fragmentation time scale upon which gas will be consumed. And so the filament will disappear as it's all converted into individual fragments. And so the balance of these time scales sets where you are on this relationship. And so this flow of mass from outside the clouds sets the balance of the hierarchy of the structure within them. It also determines, it's something we've just talked about, where you're likely to form the mass of stars. So on this relationship, there are a couple of um, crosses. These are hub systems, the spaces where you get lots of filaments interacting. And where we find these is where we have very high accretion rates from the outside. So accretion rates of about 500 solar masses per parsec per mega year, which is massive by a galaxy scale. <laughs> and you can see that that high accretion rate pushes them down into this fragmentation regime. And you no longer have one well-defined filament, but you've got these hubs which are pulled together into something which is more spherical. It's like a single condensation. And then that very high density environment where you have a lot of accretion, that's where we see a lot of massive stars forming. And there is now that connection to the larger environment. So I think that picks up the question we had before as well. Okay, uh, we can talk about filament spacing, um, but let's finish um, with Richard Larson, which is always a good thing to do. Um, because Richard Larson is a bit, I, I don't know if any of you ever read Richard Larson's papers, you really should. Um, he basically did everything in star formation um, 30 years before everybody else, but we were all just too stupid to notice <laughs> consistently. 
Um, he worked out, you know, you've probably seen the Larson solution for how a core of gas collapses. He did that in his PhD in the 70s on punch cards. And then after which he gave up being a numerical astrophysicist and then just found these fundamental scaling laws to determine um, how the gas evolves. So a bit of a personal hero. Um, basically, when we did this analysis of the filamentary structure um, of the ISM, we found that what we'd basically done was rediscover Larson's scaling laws for how turbulence and um, the size of a cloud um, relates to its internal velocity dispersion. So these are the Larson's and Pericle derived relationships. The velocity dispersion of a region is proportional to the half power of the size scale of the region. Um, the mass is about two times your length, um, so your length scale squared, and your number density is um, inversely proportional to the size scale. And these are all basically can be explained by constant column density and um, contours for the latter two, but in terms of an energy balance um, to understand this. So when we did the same thing for filaments, we found that you ended up with the same relations, but there was a difference because when you take into account the filamentary nature of the interstellar medium, this energy balance now was only in the radial direction. And so by taking into account of this um, structure, you can see that it's very easy to make mass flow along filaments. And so that's another way how you can connect um, the large scale structure to the small scale um, through these accretion flows. Okay. I guess and we have to wrap up. Yeah. Okay. Oh, thank you. Um, so we can have right now, sure. <laughs> we have time for one or two questions, maybe for the entire talk. Don't hesitate to go back to the previous slides, the first slides, if you haven't had Absolutely, time. yes. Um, I'll, I'll put it up again so you can see. Um, so one last question. Yes, Brent. Actually, I'll get on there. Hey, Rowan, beautiful stuff. Hey. Let's link the first part with the last part. So you showed these beautiful bubbles. Mm. At the smaller scales, those bubbles are about, you know, 100 parsecs or so. And then you go to the filaments, the larger scales are about 100 parsecs or so. Uh, how do those bubbles link to those filaments? Mm. Yeah. I think that's a good question. I mean, I think the thing to remember about the the bubbles is they're not actually going. I mean, yeah, it seems like if we let's show this example again. You know that that's a very nice example, but that's also very large. You know, that's um, a structure that you're seeing that's you know about a kiloparsec in size. When you look down to it, you can see that the edges are not completely smooth around the outside. And that these bubbles are expanding into a region that had pre-existing structure. And so when you think about that compression from the bubble, you're not going to get one continuous structure. It's going to have filaments inside it. And so I would say that a lot of these filaments might be parts of the edge of the bubble. In fact, the thing I would have gone on to if I had even more time just as an extra bonus, <laughs> and I will now take an advantage of we are at the center of one of these bubbles. This is the local bubble. That's us. Um, we can make it nice and loud. So that's us. That's a local bubble. Um, you can see there's an expanding. We're in the middle of a region where there's been supernova expansion. It's pushed out the gas around us. And what do we find? Is we find all the nearby clouds are actually on the rim of this bubble. Um, so I think that's Perseus there. I might be wrong. Um, that's between two and these clouds have filamentary shapes and distributions so um, yeah I, I would say that it's not a smooth bubble it, it contains substructures and filaments thank you let's thank her again <laughs>